it's so deeply concerning that an entity that has so many people following it has so much money like the Mormon church recommended that parents go see Jody Hildebrandt. The internet has been absolutely on fire all week thanks to the release of all of the documents and videos for the Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt trials. Now, it's been alleged even in these documents that Jody Hildebrandt is a cult leader and Ruby Frankie throughout this trial has kind of changed her tune where at first she was very, very confident that she would get off. And by the time she made her statement during her sentencing, she was taking a little more responsibility, but still claiming that she was influenced by Jody. So what is the real truth? Using all of these documents and videos, we are going to try to unpack that a little bit. We're gonna talk all about the ins and the outs of these documents, these videos, and this case, and it might be a lot to handle, so I'm gonna say right now, viewer discretion is advised. So, take a nice deep breath because it's time to let the fresh air in. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. I hope you're having an amazing day so far. My name is Erin and I am obsessed with all things cult, true crime, and unique spiritual practices. I just kind of want to get to the bottom of human behavior, especially if it's a little more manipulative. I just desperately want to understand it. So if you're like that too, you're just constantly seeking information and understanding of cults, of serial killers, of manipulative people in general, well then this is the place for you. I drop a couple videos a week on a cult that I find interesting or a case that's going on in the news media. So please subscribe if you are interested. Chad Daybell's trial is coming up on Monday, so if you're like, I don't know if I want to subscribe yet, it might be the perfect time to because I will be covering that trial extensively and really unpacking all of the information that we have never heard before. Like, who was Chad's influence? Was he involved in a cult? This is a topic I've been looking into since the inception of my channel back in September. It was one of the topics I wanted to cover first, but then I saw his trial was coming up this following year, so I was like, no, I should do it then. So it's been a long time in the making, so look forward to that video next week. Now, this is a very heavy video and we might be here for a long time. So I want to say again, please just use caution while watching. I'm not going to break down every single piece of evidence that has been released. There are countless other channels that have done incredible breakdowns and I'll try to remember to leave them down in the description or pinned comment down below so you can check them out if you want a lot more information. I want to talk more about kind of the psychological game it seems that every character is playing when it comes to this case, besides the innocent children, obviously. And if you're like, Erin, I really don't know what you're talking about, I did make a video giving everyone a background on this trial and also tying it to connections and uncovering and unpacking why that is a cult. And now with what we're learning from the trial and the things that Jody has said and the things that we're learning from Ruby and her husband and all of the evidence that we've seen, it's really starting to create this picture of a cult-like atmosphere. So if you want more of a breakdown and kind of a review of this case overall, you can click right up here. So with this story, I want to start from the beginning. It's been absolutely heartbreaking to watch what these children underwent. A young boy having to flee through basically the desert to find a neighbor who's nice enough to take him in is an outcome I wouldn't wish on anybody, let alone a child. 
And in this body cam footage, we actually ended up seeing them do a search of Jody Hildebrandt's house and find another terrified, malnourished, and definitely a child. Have a seat. What's your name? How'd you get here? I... I... The neighbor then calls 911. Tell me exactly what's happened. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. And he uh, said he had just came from a neighbor's house, and we know there's been problems at this neighbor's house. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry, and he's thirsty. Is, he, is your door locked? No, I'm sitting outside with him on the, on the front patio. Okay, cool. He asked us to call the police. You come in, my buddy. I am a police officer. Are you okay? Do you need me? Hey, you okay? Is this just you in here? I'm Sergeant Tobler. What's your name? Just I just have one. Where's your sister at? Contact one. You okay? Huh? You doing okay? You don't want to talk to me? Yeah, that's okay. Can you come with me, though? Sergeant Tobler would later tell ABC News they initially believed Frankie's daughter was a little boy due to the young girl having a buzz cut at the time. Sonia. Who did him? You're not in trouble with me, okay? We're just trying to figure out what's going on. Our main focus right now is you. And just okay. thank goodness this young boy was so brave to flee where he was being held captive for over a year. And luckily he seemed to pick the best house because the person was more than ready and willing to jump in and help him. Now I want to rewind because something I find so strange, but also interesting. And I think it really speaks to the narcissistic qualities that many cult leaders have. This idea that the things that they are practicing and saying are going to be so valuable that cameras are always rolling. This idea that you must be recording everything I say, or I want to take a video of this workshop because it's going to be so valuable to everybody else. And basically, kind of what it seems like to me in this particular case with Jody and Ruby, it's almost like they were using her children as scapegoats or almost like guinea pigs so that potentially Jody could sell her little connections culty parenting skills because I can't see how any person in their right mind could rationalize harming children and then keeping a play-by-play -play diary about all of the that they are putting on their children and why. I mean, that's evidence enough to what you're doing to these poor children and you're writing it down. And that's what seems to always be the demise of these cult leaders. Keith Ranieri, he was literally recorded saying, make it look like the women are consenting to getting branded with my initials. Make sure they say brand me master. We just did the trial with Nature Boy and we see a ton of evidence of him women because he recorded it and put it on the internet. And if you're curious about that, I have a video up here detailing, I mean, several videos, honestly, I'll link my playlist actually up here so that you can check that out if you're interested in it. And I think part of the reason this is so frustrating for so many people and confusing is because with Ruby Frankie's internet fame that she had from her Eight Passengers YouTube channel, she was also documenting the abuses that she was putting her children through and people were screaming from the rooftops, begging someone to do something about it. And nobody did until a poor 12-year-old boy had to escape from a terrorized life. It's confusing and frustrating and just brings up so many questions. What is this obsession with filming your... And then in Ruby Frankie's case, saying you didn't know it was a... That you were 
influenced to do this, that you really thought that this is what your child needed. And it's like, well, you've been recording what you do to these kids for years. And I don't remember anyone talking about Jody Hildebrandt back when you had eight passengers. It seems like Jody Hildebrandt's infiltration and kind of takeover to your family happened after or maybe towards the tail end. So I know I'm speculating a lot here, guys, but I have a lot of opinions. And don't worry, there are timestamps down in the description box below if you're like, I'm tired of your rambling, Erin. I just want to see the footage. But don't worry. We are going to start reading her diary. And just as I'm scrolling through this, a lot has been redacted to protect the children's identities and locations and things like that. A lot of the personal details. I mean, these children have been exploited their entire lives, so they fully deserve to not have to go through any more public humiliation or exploitation of their private lives. So if there's anything super blacked out, that is just redacted information. But I will read with you what we do learn from these documents. And just right as we start looking here, in my opinion, it is extremely telling that this document, this journal is titled Timeline. It's a timeline of all of the things they did to these children. So I just can't help but wonder, like, were you guys basically experimenting on your children to see if they found salvation? It's just so eerily similar to Lori Vallow. And I know that that situation had a much dire circumstance. I totally understand that. But this idea of these children being evil and needing help and only I'm allowed to dish out this to them, like this is no matter what religion you're a part of. This should be unacceptable. May 21st, 2023, Jody receives a blessing from the temple president, meaning the Mormon temple. May 22nd, the children go to Jody's to help spring clean. The 28th, they meet Jeremy. June 13th, Jody goes to Salt Lake City to meet with Jeremy and Brad. June 30th, child refuses to do wall sits, says he's done. July 1st, child is to stay outside, sleep outside, only come in when he needs to bathroom and shower. He's 11 at this point. 11 years old, has to sleep outside. July 14th, one of the children refuses to work, screams. So her punishment for not wanting to work, which I don't even know what that could be, but it sounds like forced child manual labor. It doesn't say do chores. It says work. And so for punishment, Jody shaves their head. July 15th, boy's first attempt to run away at 1.15 in the morning. Ruby finds him at 3.14 a.m. Jody drives to Arizona to find property. I wonder why, like, I just, I, I, all I can think of is, like, the allegations that Jeff and Shalia have for Twin Flames Universe to go find land to expand and create a commune, basically. I'm like, what were they thinking? Were they thinking they were just going to, like, take these kids to some piece of land and pull an FLDS and just, like, start building a compound so they can do whatever they want to these kids? Just, like, why? Why? This is why I believe it was some kind of business. They were like, oh, if we can show that we can heal these children, then I can sell this to parents. Or Jody genuinely believes that this is what heals children, and it's so scary. July 9th on a Sunday. Child turns 12 tomorrow. I never envisioned him being 12, still pooping and peeing himself. Satanic choices led one to becoming destitute, even in the most affluential homes. Yeah, it must be his satanic choices that are causing him to soil himself. He's a child. He's 12 and you're punishing him on his birthday? The next day, it's his birthday. He doesn't even know what month it is. Isn't that heartbreaking for you as a mother that you're, I'm like trying not to cry. I'm like simultaneously heartbroken and want to scream. It's so unthinkable that you could treat anyone like this, let alone your own child. They have been in so much deviant behavior, they won't control their bodily functions. They're both furious that their selfish, sinful lifestyle is being intervened upon. I told one of them that he 
emulates a snake. He slithers and sneaks around looking for opportunities when no one is watching, and then he scurries. He's probably trying to escape because you're a monster. If he wants to emulate the Savior, he needs to be 100% obedient with exactness. No wavering, no hiding. This is a classic culty ideology. You must suffer in order for God to love you. If you aren't obedient, you're with Satan. And it's like, I'm trying, I'm obedient, but I don't want to get anymore. I don't want to get hurt anymore. And that's what cult leaders do a lot too. You try to leave, you say that something isn't working for you, you feel resistance to something and they're, they'll say, well, you must be abandoning yourself or I guess you don't want to become enlightened or one with the universe or I never thought you would let yourself down and stop growing. It's like, uh, it's just this manipulative tactic to keep someone in the group. But in this case, she's exploiting her kids and she's taking advantage of the fact that she's supposed to be her, their caregiver. It's it's disgusting. Her son lies all the time. He's a compulsive liar. Well, if he tells the truth, you probably punish him. He's probably literally trying to save himself. He's probably desperately trying not to say the wrong thing because he knows if he says the wrong thing, he's going to have a punishment. I never would have suspected this entire experience is a shock to my system. I never would if I suspected the cold, dead heart he has. And I suppose one can argue because this is what Ruby claims. So let's just say she's correct. Let's just say she has partially been influenced by Jody, and this is something she felt resistant to, just like another survivor of a cult. Perhaps she has someone barking in her ear how evil her children are, how evil her children are. But this is when discernment has to start speaking to you and you need to start listening to that. Like this should have been a glaring red flag that someone, even if you're being influenced by someone, and this is not the stance I normally take, but in order to protect our children, at some point we really have to question what people are telling us if we are subjecting our children to misconduct. This is the type of thing that leads down the line to what happened to Lori Vallow's children, JJ and Tylee. That happened because someone got in her mind and she started believing that they were actually evil entities. And if she killed them, because that's the only way to expel a certain darkness, they would be living on in heaven happily as themselves and they'd be freed from this demonic spirit. But that's not true. You're still killing an innocent child. And if we don't start depending on our own instincts and make sure we ask questions, this is how things escalate to what happened so tragically, JJ and Tylee. Because thank goodness this little boy Ruby Frankie's son escaped when he did because who knows what would have happened at this point. I told him if he divulged everything, he would automatically begin repenting. I asked him, and then there's stuff cut off. I told him that he needs God. I invited him to fast and pray. It's in and out of possession. He is workable and calm for a bit, then angry and defiant the next. The only consistent thing about him is that he lies. Her other child is better behaved with Jody. She likes to think that she can manipulate me. No, I just I I just don't believe a child is like truly I mean kids can manipulate in cute ways where they want a treat or the older kid wants attention cuz the new baby is getting attention like we see we make you might make a joke of oh she's so manipulative she knows exactly what to do to like get your attention but a child's not manipulating you with malintent a child might it just doesn't make sense to me it does not make sense to me her daughter likes to think she can still manipulate me i gave her a pixie haircut All her long hair is gone. No more distracting with hair. Her son told her that he would rather have a glass of water than me as his mom. That should tell you something, Ruby. That should tell you something. July 11th. Big day for evil. My daughter manipulates me. 
She won't scream when Jody is around, but with me, she wails. That could be because she trusts you more, but I mean, especially if Jody's inflicting more of the punishments on her, the physical punishments, I'm not sure. All night, she screamed and cried and would hit her head on the floor. Today, Jody confronted her, and she admits to putting on a show for her mother. She says she wants to be pitiful. Her son was told to stand in the sun with his sun hat. He's defiant. No. I tell him a couple more times. Blank says, or I should say his demon, stays in the shade, and I push him into the sun. He comes back, and I push back with a cactus poker. When I poke his back to get in the sun, he doesn't even flinch. I poke him on the neck. He's in a trance and doesn't appear to feel anything. Jody taps him on the cheeks to wake him up. The devil doesn't like when you get your subject to anger to truth. And this is just disgustingly manipulative considering what she's making her children do. Do you know that I love you? Yes, ma'am. Do you know... G. Joe loves you? Yes, ma'am. Do you know the Savior loves you? Yes, ma'am. He wants out of his outcomes. After our talk, he stays in the shade. I take my mop water and I go and show him the water and then I pour the water on him. It's hot outside. It feels good, doesn't it? Yes. It takes an evil person to even come up with doing these to someone. It's like she's projecting the evil. I think I might have to not go through this entire document with you all. Like I said, there have been many other creators covering it. Annie Elise in particular has a three-hour long podcast called Seriously on this topic. I think it might also be up on YouTube at this point. And she's great. I'm a big fan of hers. So I would definitely go listen to that if you want to listen to literally like all of the details. She's very thorough. She does great research. But I'll just finish up this diary entry and then we'll move on to some video footage. An hour later, Jijo takes R to a little walk to the pool. She talks about how she has love twisted. If R likes something, does he call it love? If he doesn't, he thinks it's not loving. Jijo then pushed him into the pool, swam up to the side, and he pushed him out. Feel good? Refreshing? Yes, ma'am. Wow. So this little boy is like calling out what's going on. Like you're hurting me and then you're asking me if I love you, but I don't like when you do that to me. That is not loving to me. So I don't want to say I love you. And then they're like, well, you're going to get pushed into the pool. I went out a couple hours later and asked if he wanted the pool again. Yes, ma'am. Will you let me push you in? He laughed and then tried not to act too excited. He cooled off and went back to his spot. I put my hands on his face and asked, Have you ever heard someone talk underwater? Yes, ma'am. I know blank is in there somewhere. I know deep down under all this anger, you can hear me. It may sound like I'm underwater with you, but hear me. I love you. And he got teary. Then I put my hand tightly over his nose and mouth. I am coming to you in this water and putting my hands on your nose and mouth. The devil lies and says I'm hurting you, hurting you, but blank, am I really doing it? You are putting oxygen on me to help me breathe. Yes, that's right. It's so much worse than we all realized. I think that what is so shocking about these documents is it is so insanely, it's so much worse than we thought. I mean, we knew it was bad. We knew it was going to be bad and really upsetting. But it's even worse. It's even worse. He looked like he wanted to beat me up this morning. And then he was intrigued, interested. And then two hours later, he drinks water from the hose. He steals water. What a... You're del- she's What a delusional woman. I'm censoring myself a lot for YouTube, but there have been times I've had to repeat myself because I'm like cursing. (laughs) So if it sounds like I'm just like, you dumb woman, I'm definitely trying to say something else, but I'm not. 
He's compulsive and he feels no remorse for his choices. He shuts down and says he wants to go to jail. It probably would be better at this point. And a lot of children, when they're getting they've actually said, I would rather go to jail. So it's like, I would rather misbehave and go to jail than be treated this way. We just talked about this in my two episode series all about the troubled teen industry. Here's my most recent video up here, but I do have two, one from this past Monday and one from about two Mondays ago. So please go check those out. He says he worships the devil and has no interest in changing. I want the outcome to be changed, but I don't want to do the work that it requires. Because yeah, he's like, if worshiping the, at this point, he's like, if worshiping the devil means I won't get a by you, then I'd rather worship the devil. <laughs> like what she's doing is, is, has, is having the opposite effect on her child. He's like so resistant now because he's like, well, if I do what you want me to do, I'm getting hurt and I'm starving. You're making the devil look pretty good right now, Ruby. He doesn't actually know what jail means. He has no comprehension what throwing your life away means. He just wants the immediate gratification of sitting in an air-conditioned car ride to juvie. He wants stimulators. Is He's in a back and forth. You know, I think she's projecting because <laughs> this whole situation made her have to throw her life away because now she's sentenced from four to 30 years in jail, and I really hope she's in there for the full term. So we're going to just jump because I want to feature her other child and the thing that things that she's done to her. She told me she figures they've been here for eight weeks. I asked her if she felt like she'd made progress over the eight weeks, and she said yes. I told her she was delusional. She has made no progress. She continues to lie and manipulate. Last night, her screaming and trance headbanging were evidence of no change. July 12th. Took the kids on a four-hour car ride. We stopped at Gunlock Lake, and I shared my love for them. We watched a baby cow get loose and walk in front of the road in front of us. I made the analogy of the not-so-wise calf to them. I was keeping them safe when they want to run in the road. We drove up to Vago. I bought a volcanic pie. I told the kids the pie was to thank Jijo for the home care and the time. He appeared enraged and she was manipulative. This is the day she anticipates breaking her two-day fast. When we get home, I let my son know that she's hardened her heart and will do one day of fasting to invite her to humble. She flipped out and began ranting. She refused to get up. She lives on the floor all day speaking dishonest chants because Jijo is on the Gijo is on the phone with clients. I don't go in and watch her level of aggression. All day she makes rhymes about my mom stars me, calls it fasting. My mom won't lift a finger bring and bring me food because all she does is lie on the bed and eat brownies. My mom says she's the most loving mom in the world, blah, blah, blah. If I can't ever go home, then what's the point in being obedient? I'm going to run away. Jijo helped me intervene after work. Allowing lies to be spewed gives the devil a platform. Articulating lies reinforces possession. The longer the lies are allowed to be spewed, the longer the intervention. Physical intervention needs to be. I cut more of her hair. We doused her in water and the dog wash. She said she wanted to turn away. Jody told her she has no idea what's waiting for her. Horrifying horrifying, especially trying to basically brainwash these kids into believing that the maltreatment they're experiencing is their own fault. It's disgusting. So we're just going to fast forward now to after jody has been arrested and she's only allowed to make calls to people on the outside and she decides to call her husband, Kevin. And it's very interesting and somewhat ironic considering <laughs> who Ruby is, but the place that she was in was called Purgatory Correctional Facility. I don't know why I feel like that is so poetic and ironic, but I loved that when I found that out. Something else that's really interesting about this particular phone call this phone call that we're about to listen to occurred on August 31st of 2023. The day before, 
Kevin Frankie was interviewed by police because his children was still in custody and he was under the impression he was going to go to the police station and pick up his kids. And then they decided they were going to sit down with him and interview him and assess if he was fit to take custody of the children who he hadn't seen at that point in over a year because Ruby and Jody told him to stay away from them. If he wanted to be a part of their lives, he had to stay away from them. It's all very manipulative and messed up, if you ask me. The timeline's super interesting because he had an interview on August 30th, 2023, the day before. And in this call with Ruby, he's telling her how much he's going to support her and love her and all of this stuff. But In his interview previously, he said that he was shocked. This was information he would never, ever have thought could happen. He felt like it wasn't real. I feel like if you find out how your children were found and that your estranged kind of wife had a hand in doing that to your children, you might not pick up the phone the next day and be like, well, I'll do whatever I can to help you. And I do want to correct something I said earlier. I believe I mentioned that Ruby claimed that Jody was a cult leader. It was actually Kevin in this interview with police. He alludes to the fact that she is a cult leader. So we are going to start off with the phone calls from prison and just a few snippets of them. And then I'll show you how interesting his reaction the day before was. It just is not adding up to me makes no sense to me but i'd love to hear what you think i do feel strong Mm -hmm. and so calm and you know what they they may adults have a really hard time understanding that children can be full of evil and what that takes to fight it do you want an easy way to create professional invoices try it free at skynova.com you've seen what it takes i was reading him and it was like the worst part was not knowing the end. He said those who he said he had a room, a, an inmate that's man search for meaning. He was a prisoner in World War Two, and he said the worst part and the greatest bringing of depression was not the lack of food and it wasn't the weather conditions. It was not knowing how long it would last. So I think I was prepared for this. I do feel strong mm-hmm. and so calm. And you know what? They they may. Adults have a really hard time understanding that children can be full of evil and what that takes to fight it. You've seen what it takes to fight evil. It's not the person you're fighting. And it can look like something it's not. And you've been there, you know that. And so I don't know any adults who are going to see the truth. How convenient for you that you don't think adults will be able to see the truth. So who will? Who will be able to see the truth? Other children? Let's just pray you're kept away from children for the rest of your life, which you are because you're in jail now. It's also quite interesting to me because she will change her tune also, which good, like thank goodness she starts to see the light by the end of the trial, which we will review. But this alone is utterly, utterly shocking. The fact that she was even, I mean, you have to know the calls are going to be recorded in jail, you know, and the fact that she's even saying this, like, do you really think this won't be used against you later? It's a recorded phone call. And now we're just skipping ahead. It is the same day. A month ago, Business Insider was reaching out to me and I ignored their email, but um, I'm going dark. This is a witch. I'm out of BYU. I'm not at BYU anymore, so I don't know how they're going to find me. She Did you hear her say, this is a witch hunt? Is it a witch hunt? Because you detailed in your journal all of the terrible things you did to your children. That's what you wrote in your journal. And we have video footage of the state your children were in. So. Is it a witch hunt? Give me a break. This is a witch hunt. I, I, 
the devil's been after me for years. How convenient when people are discovered of their wrongdoing. How convenient that it's always um, the devil being after you. Oh, the devil has a target on my back. Or I I heard spirit tell me that this was going to be. Oh, you did? The devil wasn't talking to you when you were doing terrible things to your child? I It's one of my biggest pet peeves when anyone who believes in the devil blames any any negative criticism about what they're doing on, well, they're just the devil attacking me. No, maybe they're actually asking the right questions and being more critical of your point of view and they deserve you to listen to them because we all need to be critically thinking better <laughs> and more often no matter what our point of view or religion or belief is. We should always be seeking truth and answers and be willing to hear the opposing point of view. That's the only way we can be a true, well-rounded human. So for you to say, oh, this person who has a different viewpoint of me, well, they're the devil and they're after me. Are you delusional? What is this? He's mad as hard to death. Have you shared that with the detectives? I have not said a word until I have an attorney. Okay, well, you know that this phone call is being recorded. You have one minute remaining for this call. Yes, that will come out. That will come out. Okay. When we were when we were driven to the jail, um, the detective was putting us in the car, and Jody said, "I trust you." So. They're going to be in the hospital for three days. So weird. It's just not necessary. They're trying to exaggerate this. Your children were dehydrated, malnourished, and now they're under medical watch for their well-being. And you're calling it unnecessary. Because you did it. And I'd like to add, like, why are you kind of playing the victim now? so convenient that now suddenly you're the victim of people trying to attack you because they're demonic devilish entities well i I don't they didn't show me well they didn't show me any pictures or anything but the way they described it it was very serious you have exceeded the allowable time for this call goodbye you called you had to put her in a so now we've jumped to September 1st, the next day. And it was it was horrible. It was torturous last night, hearing the screaming and, and the banging and people. It's like, okay, that's, that's, you know, upsetting. But the most upsetting thing is that I am completely misunderstood. That is the most horrible feeling. Like my own family misunderstands me. They misinterpret me. And... and Poor Jody, they, they misinterpret her, they misunderstand her. She puts her neck out on the line for people and then they get mad at her. I mean, it is just horrendous. It's horrendous. What's horrendous is what you and Jody did to those children. And I will say that it it does seem to me, anyways, that unless she's being very manipulative in her sentencing speech. But she did see the error in her ways. Thank goodness. It does seem like she did. So at least that is positive. But it is still very, very frustrating and somewhat like up for debate. (laughs) Did she learn a lesson? Has she deconstructed her beliefs? Has she been like de-indoctrinated? Or is she trying to manipulate the system because she knows she has to appear like she's learned a lesson and is more innocent because it seems like she's believed that children need to be punished like this for a very, very long time. Before Jody, during Eight Passengers even, she had a very corporal punishment-esque way of dealing with children. Now next, this is hopefully where we start to realize and hear that perhaps Ruby is recognizing that what she did 
was wrong and is starting to realize that she's going to have to take more responsibility and sees the error in what she did, hopefully. But this is now in December, this portion of her list of calls. Board. Jody, she can lie on her paperwork and mm-hmm. she probably will. I don't think she's going to give them her history. But I think in the interview, it's going to be apparent that she's mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that will affect how long someone, you know, because they're looking, how, how repentant are you? How much responsibility are you taking? How... Mm-hmm. How are you aware that what you've done is wrong? And she's not. She's the only reason she pled is because she didn't want to do life. And she knew I would testify. Um, the other thing is, on my plea deal, when I come up for probation, the the prosecuting attorney can. Um, well, often, if they think that you're a danger to society, we'll talk to the probationary board and, and or write them a letter saying, I think she needs to stay where she is. Um, he's going to stay neutral and not write any letter when my probation comes up, which is a really big deal. But for mm-hmm. her, he's, he's not going to stay neutral. So... We start seeing where Ruby's turning against Jody, starting to say that she's mentally unstable and starts to kind of paint this picture of perhaps recognizing that she's been in the wrong. However, she also mentions that they want to see that you are repentant. And to me, It almost feels like she knows the role she's going to have to play moving forward. Now, I hope that she is very, very repentant. I hope that she sees the error of her ways, and I hope that she truly, truly is regretting and angry at herself for what she's done. I hope that she's honest in her, in what we've heard most recent statements, but this recording right here does make me question that a little bit. Like, what is your true feeling around everything? Are you just mad you got caught? Have you done the work really to deconstruct your beliefs? Because it takes a lot of time. I mean, this is just August through December. That's not that much time. I think a cult survivor or even um, someone who is in a DV relationship or a highly manipulative relationship will tell you like it takes a long time to just untangle the web of lies, untangle your brain almost from what you were believing previously. And as much as I want to believe that she's done the work, I don't know if I fully believe that yet, but that could change. I could totally change my point of view. But I'm curious, what do you guys think? Is she being honest? Has she changed? Or is Ruby Frankie just... Always Ruby Frankie, where she just discounts the value of children and parents them how she wants and takes away their food and takes away their bed and takes away their door if they ever have the little, littlest hint of misbehaving. What do you guys think? Before we jump into the next one, I also want to mention I have this feeling that Ruby is going into this thinking, if Jody's found guilty, I'll be found innocent. Like, if I can paint the picture that Jody totally manipulated me and got me to do all these bad things, I will get off easier. I'll just get probation. But that's obviously not what happened. In a lot, we sang a hum, like, hummed a couple hymns, and she, she was, she was still justifying the whole time. She's like, don't worry, don't worry, we'll have our day in court. And then, and then when we were booked in, um, they put us in separate cells and we've been in separate cells ever since. Maybe just this separation 
from Jody has helped Ruby recognize what she did. I also think that someone like Jody, who's we've seen evidence that or her own, I think, niece stepping forward to say, like, no, she's been doing this stuff to children for years. I was one of them. She built a business off of her teachings as a couple's children, familial therapist. Like, she's been in the game doing this for a very long time. And so part of me thinks that Jody really believed that, like, Oh, I've been getting away with this for so long. Like, they're not – I can always talk my way out of this. They're not going to think I did anything bad. We were just trying to parent these kids. So now I want to pivot and jump into that interview, just a few clips of the interview with Jody Frankie's husband or perhaps ex-husband at this point because he learns all this information and then picks up the phone when Ruby calls him from the jail which is what we just listened to, the very first couple of calls. So I'm very curious what you think about this little, these little clips. Or July 25th, Joy, July 25th. So it's my understanding that, that at least home here in, in Kanta and Ivan's, have you been to that home? No. You've not been to that home? Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know what anything that's been going on. Like this is good, man. Like I would love to be able to help you out with this, and like I'm seeing the light of the end of the because I'm I'm unaware of your involvement in in what's really going on. So for you to say that you're unaware of the status of your kids kind of makes I know that sounds kind of crummy to you, but it sounds kind of good to me. Like who lives in that home with your is it ex-wife? Is it currently a separated wife? Like, who lives in that home with your children? To be honest, I don't know. I, I know that she's there with um, four of the children and our two older children have moved out. They're, they're not at your home in Springville? Uh, and I'm not trying to where, trip you up. I can see you're hesitant to talk to me. I understand that. Well, where where I live? No, yeah. I haven't seen them for over a year. Okay. That's tough. I just can't imagine not trying to see your children for a year. Like, just speaking from my experience, my parents had, like, a very nasty custody situation when I was growing up. And I can't imagine what would have happened if... Either of my parents had said, no, you don't get to see them for a year. Like, if one of my parents didn't see me for a week, they'd be like, what's going on? How is my kid? Where are they? I need to see them. And I understand, especially because we understand cult dynamics and, like, the mind games and how things really don't – things that don't – shouldn't make sense, you let make sense in your brain. You know, it's that cognitive dissonance we talk about a lot. It's confirmation bias where you're only seeking information that helps you support what you already believe. You're not really seeking out new information that might prove that belief wrong. It's very, very complicated and murky when you get into how the mind works, especially when there is a coercive controlling element to it, which I do believe there was in this case. However, it's it I can't help but ask the question and be concerned with why didn't you make sure you saw your children? It is concerning. The only thing I can really think of is if he trusted that Jody was helping his family because Jody was appointed by leaders of the Mormon church to and suggested to families who were having marital issues or family issues, the church suggested they go see Jody. She had like this pipeline from church officials. So he probably trusted that Jody was doing things with good intention and was working very closely with his wife. And maybe he did believe that this is what he needed to do in order for their family to be successful. But I think it raises a lot of questions for people like, 
why wouldn't you just make sure you could see them? Why wouldn't you say like, this is raising a lot of red flags for me. I'm not comfortable with this. It is, there's like such a huge question mark, you know? Yeah, it's just like, oh, if only he'd just like driven over there to check on his kids one day in a year. What could have, what could have he, what could he have saved his kids from? So we're going to jump to the point in the interview where the investigator starts asking questions like, who is Jody? How is she involved in your life, in your family? How long have you been separated? And so we're just going to listen to this little portion of the call. We have fast forwarded a little bit. That's something you came to the realization that you needed help and weren't doing things right? Or that's something that like Jody helped you guys recognize that maybe Ruby needed more? I'm trying to understand her involvement in your guys' life. Um, she's my focus, I'll just be honest. I understand and I, I can perceive that. Um, Jody and Ruby have a, um, a close relationship and, and Jody saw the need for me to get help. And um, frankly, I agree. I, the space um, has been exactly what I need to face you know, my own um, addictions and, and receive the support and help that I've needed. And so this space has been um, very, very good for me. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, stated that you and Ruby had this no contact that you guys just verbally agreed upon, was that an idea given by Jody that she recommended you guys have that space and not contact one another? I'm not aware of that. It, the, the invitation for me to leave and take space was from my wife. Okay. But that was while Jody and Ruby were friends and collaborating and doing podcasts and sure. Well, you're the you're the custodial parent of these children. I don't see why we can't explain to you what why we're involved. So I don't recall the exact time, but sometime before 11 o'clock today, we received uh, a phone call from 911 on our dispatch that uh, a 12 to 13 year old boy was knocking on doors in a neighborhood asking for food and water, that he was severely emaciated, that he had... What is emaciated? Skinny, scrawny. Uh, malnutrition, not enough food, not enough water to sustain life. So he had. I'm sorry, what? He had duct tape on his extremities, on his hands, on his ankles, and those were covering rope burns that were used to tie him down. Take a second and think about what I just said. That's the condition of your son. So he had no idea that this was going on at all, according to him. But I think that this reaction here, it's so difficult for me to assess without the bias, I suppose, of knowing that he just, that he talks to his wife and voices his support to her the next day after hearing the cops tell him this. And I don't know if it's just like he wasn't sure what to believe at this time. He was getting all this new information and he was in shock. And the only thing he knew was to like stand by his wife at that time. I'm not sure, but it's all just so shocking. It's sad. It's horrific what happened to those children. Thank God they're being protected. I hope that they're healing and I hope that they are safe. My gosh. I, I don't even know if it would be healthy for these two children to be around any of their family members because if you go down the rabbit hole of the Frankie family and her sisters and all of Jody's relatives, it's just it spirals so deep into these different sometimes religious views or religious parenting point of perspectives and it's really scary too because these people are making a living off of sharing parenting 
advice. So who else has justified treating their children this way because they've watched something Ruby Frankie's put out or they've listened to something Jody wrote in her blog or they have listened to anyone who's ever been involved or a family member of eight passengers. It's bigger than just these people. It's much bigger because it creates a ripple effect where people start thinking that they're allowed to treat their children like this. It's justified because they're just casting Satan out. They're just protecting their child from this evil entity that's within them. And the extreme, the extreme of this is what happened to JJ and Tylee, Lori Vallow's children. It's truly heartbreaking. It's shocking. It's frustrating. It makes you question a lot of things. And with what we talk about on my channel a lot is this cult and true crime connection, how people get indoctrinated and justify their crimes because of whatever spiritual belief they have found themselves in. And it's so deeply concerning that an entity that has so many people following it, has so much money like the Mormon church, recommended that parents go see Jody Hildebrandt. And Ruby and Jody were partners at one point. Maybe it wasn't officially business partners, but they did act as partners in a lot of their videos when it came to Connections, the organization that Jody had created. So when we look at something like this, such a big, big case, we have to start looking at it a little bit differently because, yes, all of the behaviors are atrocious, disgusting. But if we're going to claim or imply that Jody was the reason that Ruby did all of these things, we have to start acknowledging the cult-like atmosphere that is living within our religious organizations currently. Whether or not you believe Mormonism is a cult, that's a topic for another video. But even if you talk about a different organized religion, there's always that line. There's always that line there. And you have to be able to question the authorities within whatever religion or spiritual belief that you are practicing, whether it's a church, a synagogue, whatever, wherever you're going, wherever you're practicing, whatever religion resonates with you. We have to make sure we're never towing that line of, oh, we're just blindly following whatever this leader says, because that is when we get into the trenches. And I'm not blaming any religion for what happened to these children, but I think it's interesting to talk about why there are so many Mormon-based child cults. Why? It's a very interesting question, interesting topic, and in my next video, we are going to break down the differences between someone who has done some work to deconstruct, and we're going to break down Lori Vallow's statements to the judge during her sentencing, how the woman is just going to need so much therapy. She still, her children aren't even alive anymore, and she still can't even face the fact that she had a hand in their demise, and it's utterly, utterly heartbreaking. So that is it for today's video. I know I said we would talk about Lori Vallow in this video, but there was just so much to cover, and I'm trying to keep track of the time, and we've been talking for almost an hour and a half, and I know I can ramble, so I just want to save you any more of my ramblings, but don't you worry. We have a lot of content coming up next week. So stay tuned for that. Remember to click that like and subscribe button. And if you've made it this far, why don't you share a star in the comment section so that I know you actually watched the entire video because I know this is a long one and I want to know if you guys like these long ones. Thank you guys so much again for your support. Please, please stay safe out there. Stay skeptical and always ask questions. I'm sending you all a lot of positivity, joy, and light. And until next time, bye.